filling in for him. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight for the Jim Wood uh, Speaker Series. And as you know, we have a number of high-level executive speakers. And the idea is uh, to really enhance the educational learning here for our students. So um, I hope that I can see that we have a, a, a lot of interest in the, the speaker. And uh, I can assure you, after you hear uh, his bio, you will be even more impressed. Uh, as you can see, Jerry Wilson is the Senior Vice President and Chief Customer and Commercial Officer for the Coca-Cola Company. And he has been with Coca-Cola for over 20 years and has established himself as a preeminent people leader and developer of people, dedicated to the discipline of growing his own team members. His unique combination of general management skills combined with his unwavering commitment to people development has become a model of motivational leadership. He has skyrocketed in his own career, starting from area account executive to vice president of U.S. operations for McDonald's and global COO and president of McDonald's to his current position. And that's just a few of the positions. There were numerous, actually, conventions. Uh, Mr. Wilson leads a global organization, and that global like organization actually has 1.5 billion consumers daily. Just to give you an idea of the size and the scope of that global organization. And he is responsible for crafting and executing the company's customer and commercial leadership strategy and agenda. During his 30 years of professional experience, he has proven his ability to build brands for the Coca-Cola company as well as served as distribution analyst, district sales manager, and brand manager for the U.S. Volkswagen of America. He has his MBA from Mercer, we won't hold that against him, and his uh, BA in economics from UGA. He is the author of a book, Managing Brand View, and our Jim Woods Executive Speaker Series Honor Guest this evening. Please join me in giving that heartwell welcome to our guest. Thank you. Well, good evening, and thank you for that warm introduction to Clayton State University. What a beautiful campus. What a full room. And I know there's nowhere else you'd rather be than right here <laughs> this moment. So we'll make this as painless as possible. A little bit about myself. Um, I have moved 30 times in my life. Uh, I am happily married for 30 years to my best friend, Jenny. And we have a daughter, 21, Abby, who just graduated from University of Georgia. Um, I worked my way through junior college. And I did that at DeKalb Community College, which is now Perimeter College. And that allowed me to then work my way through University of Georgia and I did that through a combination of jobs from washing dishes to um, whatever I could cobble together to pay the bills. And I uh, graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics. And when I graduated, I told friends that uh, uh, I knew people that graduated magna cum laude, and I had friends that graduated summa cum laude, and I graduated thank the laude. So <laughs> when, I, when I finished up, I, uh, I was so delighted to be out and working, and uh, I can imagine some of you in the same place. And so a few years later, I could not believe that uh, working for Volkswagen of America, I actually considered going back to school again, uh, but they had a tuition reimbursement program, and I couldn't pass up the opportunity. And so I went back to uh, graduate school at night and weekends, and uh, almost three years later, uh, finished up my MBA at Mercer University. And so what you're doing here is setting the stage for the rest of your life. Whether you're making straight A's or whether you're barely getting through. Every day is a learning moment. Every day is about you. And the future is very bright for those that have the ambition, the desire, and the values to try and win in this world. And I know that you here at Clayton State University are doing that. I want to spend a few minutes and talk a bit about what we're, what we're doing at Coke, some of the exciting future that we see for people like you. Then I want to develop the idea of this managing brand you, because each one of you are at a stage in your, in your life where you should be thinking about how you're positioned, 
how you want to stand out and how you want to do that in a manner that's true to yourself. And so at the end of that, we'll have time for some Q&A, and I look forward to a, a very rich um, time together. Obviously, you're preparing, preparing for a wonderfully bright future right here on campus. And while it may seem like you're just studying utils and widgets and margins and all of these theoretical obtuse ideas, my advice to you is to do the very best you can to grasp this. Because as you graduate, you'll begin to put this together in the real world. And you'll be surprised how much of this really does make sense. Now, I'm pleased to have been with Coca-Cola for 21 years. And so as I tell people, I'm a 30-year overnight success story. So the idea of persevering, of working hard on an idea, and, and continuing to develop over time is another uh, proven idea, even though each one of you should expect to have probably 10 to 20 different types of jobs in your own career. We're blessed to work for an organization that served 1.6 billion consumers today, that has business with over 400 brands and does business in over 200 countries. And we have almost a million employees worldwide. So we're really um, positioned for the current recession uh, times that we're in. But there are some massive trends that we're looking at today which are very interesting and something that you should be thinking about for your own self. Um, first, by the year 2020, it's clear that there won't be one superpower. There will be many, many different powers. Brazil, Russia, India, China. Today, Indonesia has almost 300 million consumers with a per capita uh, income of less than 4,000 US dollars. And we expect that to be over 400 million by 2020. And you can go on and on. Pakistan, a country with 176 million consumers which is about the sixth largest economy in the world. The purpose of this is for you to know that the world is at your disposal. The global reality is here today. And we think that by 2020, the world will be $20 trillion richer, which is going to drive enormous demand for all kinds of products, all kinds of services, and all kinds of, whoa, opportunities. So we're going <laughs> to, that's Tiger Woods. But that's like 15 <laughs> minutes from now. So we'll try to back this up a little bit and see what happens. OK. Um, one of the biggest things to consider over the next 10 plus years, there are three massive trends that are going to position all of you for greatness. One is that by 2020, there will be over 850 million more consumers moving into cities, moving into towns, moving out of villages all around the world. So this mass urbanization trend is here, and it's going to happen over the next 10 years, which is going to then drive a tremendous middle class expansion, one like we've never seen in the history of commerce, in the history of society. More people living in middle class in towns and cities all around the world, which is going to result in a tremendous per capita in, uh, income increase, as much as 30 to 40 percent higher per capita income for individuals all around the world. This increased purchasing power is going to open up new markets for new ideas, new products, and all kinds of new services that we haven't even thought about today. We are making sure that we've got the right people to try and capitalize on that. But today, you, we, all of us are surrounded by brands. We don't say a single day goes on without you using the, uh, one of your favorite brands in conversation, whether that's Nike, look around the room at the clothing that you're wearing. Nobody says, bring me a piece of tissue that I can use to put my makeup on. They ask for a Kleenex. And so we live in a branded world. And a few years ago, I started playing with the idea of what if we took the discipline of brand building and put it to work for us as people and literally follow a brand building discipline for us to position us for the life that we want to lead. And so that led to the threshold question, what if you thought of yourself as a brand? 
Would you be living the life you're living today? Would you be studying the courses you're taking today? Would you be with the friends that you have today? Because brands take the time to identify what they want to stand for, and they're willing to sacrifice to get there. And so we'll talk about that for the next few minutes, but the really the headline of today is I want to encourage you to unleash the power of brand you. Whether that's taking more risk, whether that's stretching yourself, whether that's full, more fulfillment, more growth. Maybe you want to reinvent completely. Maybe you want to change the world that you're in. Whatever it is, you've got wonderful gifts inside of you that you can share with the world to help you to be very successful. Peter Drucker once said, if you want to predict the future, create it. And that's what this book is all about. Managing Brand You, Seven Steps to Creating Your Most Successful Self. Notice it doesn't say seven steps to getting your greatest job. Because a job is merely one part of your successful life, one part of your successful self. Now the first thing I want to do is unsell the idea. This is not about you getting your face on the box of Wheaties. It's not about you trying to act like someone else. It's not about you trying to mimic another person. It's not about dress for success. Some of the coolest people in the world stand on their own two feet and they do it on their own terms. And all of you have heroes in your life, whether that's musicians, athletes, artists, business people, community leaders, ministers, family members, whomever. And you respect them because they're authentic, right? They stand for something real, don't they? They're true to themselves. And so the first thing I'm here to say is that this is about you getting in touch with yourself, learning what William turns you on, what makes you happy, and then figuring out how to build that into your life plan. And I know that sounds like maybe a little bit of a utopian approach, but the people that live the happiest life, the people that live the most successful life, adhere to that. And they don't let others knock them off their kilter. So the first thing is let's do, do a little branding 101. What is a brand? In the context of this conversation, it is the promise plus the experience which creates a relationship over time. So let's take an easy one here, McDonald's. How many here have been to McDonald's? We've all been to McDonald's sometime. It's a great brand. It's a simple brand, isn't it? Fast, accurate, friendly, clean, safe, at a good value. Served by people that are treating you with respect. When that happens, the experience grows and your relationship is positive and you'll go back. When it doesn't happen, the opposite occurs. It's a bad brand experience. The question you should be asking yourself, what is your brand promise? And how do people experience that? How many of you will be graduating in the next year? Guess what the unemployment is? High. Which means you need to be thinking very much about how you're going to differentiate yourself on a platform that's real. So if you get a job, and it's an entry-level job, and your goal is to be seen as an upwardly mobile graduate of Clayton State University, and you go to your meetings, and you're late, and you're not prepared, and you don't do your homework, and you don't contribute, the promise that you're trying to make is not the experience you're delivering, and so the relationship is not going to happen. You see how simple that is? It doesn't have to be some long, huge, complicated thing. Now, earlier this year, we saw a fabulous example of a brand promise. U.S. Air left LaGuardia on a simple airplane flight that landed in the Hudson. Captain Sullenberger and his crew landed, saving 150-plus people on that flight. The promise was safety. The experience was a crash. The, ex the relationship, can you imagine what these people felt like when they were standing on the wing of that plane in the Hudson River, safe? The captain of that flight said he couldn't sleep for well over a week because he failed in his promise. Because his promise wasn't to crash an airplane. And he said, I crashed an airplane. 
Now you think about that reference point. He saved lives. He was a hero. But in this case, what he would tell you he did is, I only did the job I was paid to do. Great brands know how to focus and sacrifice, whereas we as people try to be all things to all people all the time, don't we? Especially women. Women in the audience serving many masters, right? Multitasking. Men, you know it. You can nod too. <laughs> and so the idea here is why, you know, brands focus on a target audience. Here's a wonderful example. MTV. Who's the target audience for MTV? You. Right? Even younger than you. So what do your parents think about this? What do your grandparents think about this? Are they happy? Thumbs up? Thumbs down? Guess what? MTV doesn't care. <laughs> MTV is all about irreverence, about the badge of youth, growing up, being independent, and standing for that, right? This is a brand that knows how to focus and knows how to sacrifice. And so when they say, we're not targeting you, Jerry, me, although I love MTV, actually, um, <laughs> they, they, they know who their target is, who's your target. Who matters most in your life? And are you delivering against that target audience? Great brands also know how to promise and deliver. Even better, under-promise and over-deliver. Who is this? What, when you see Tiger Woods, what attributes come to your mind immediately? Competitive, winner, determination. Come on, what's this side? What am I hearing here? What do you think of? Money. Money. <laughs> money. Oh, I love it. Honesty. That's right. Like a billion dollars worth of money. That's more than money. That's like a company. You know what's funny? No one said golfer. You know why? Because golf is his job. That's not what he stands for. This guy is never satisfied. He wins a tournament, goes to the tee box, and reworks his swing. What's your brand? You're a student today. That's your job. But what's your brand? The beyond the functional reality of what you're studying, what do you stand for? They also communicate with consistency. And man, today, you know, this generation's got all kinds of great opportunities and wicked mistakes that can be made in this quick digital space. Always connected, always Twittering, always plaque sewing, always YouTubing, always everything. But you've got to realize that in brands, everything communicates. Everything. And so when you're putting on your Facebook that big party with the funnel picture, right? I, th I know who you are. <laughs> and it was fun when you posted it, but wait till an employer who's equally hip goes on Facebook to get to know you before the interview. I'm not doing that. But I bet others are thinking about that because they want to know the real you not the interview you. So let's take an interesting example, OK? Mr. Mr. Phelps, Mr. Phelps, Mr. Wheaties, Mr. Sports Eye, Mr. Bong. <laughs> this is just a kid that happened to be a great swimmer who had attention deficit disorder, raised by his mom, all American, gets caught on this one picture on YouTube comes out brand issue, right? Now, how damaged do you think this brand is today because of that? Out of a scale of 1 to 100, probably very little. Very little. Isn't that interesting? Why? Now, what if this was anabolic steroids? But this is a guy that went to a party, he came clean, he's like, I'm sorry, I'm stupid, I went there, I, you, that's probably me. You know, <laughs> probably, <laughs> it's probably me. And, and the fact that he just kind of did it and went out and then won some races, he's back on. But, you, you know, think about your own brand. Um, there are a lot of brands I could have talked about. Martha Stewart, which is an older brand.
but here's a woman who faced the music, went to jail, you know, came out as a stronger brand. So whatever your own predicament, whatever your own situation, think in terms of how you replatform, how you continue to reposition, reinvent, and go forward. Positioning with purpose, this is a fun brand. Who would have thought a chicken brand would use a cow as the frame of reference? Pretty clever, isn't it? Pretty clever. And here's this poor cow trying to save the cows, eat more chicken. They've been very consistent, stayed with it, very successful campaign, great marketing positioning. But they chose a frame of reference that was very quirky, similar to what 7up um, did years ago against Sprite with the Uncola. So there are different ways to position brands. So there are a few questions that you may want to think about asking yourself. What is your brand promise, and how well are you delivering on that today? Who's your target audience? Who are those people in your world? Starting with yourself, you're the first target audience, because you've got to be true to yourself. What is the area of focus and what are you willing to sacrifice? Have you established a unique point of difference and how consistent are you on your own messages? Now, I want to take just a brief few minutes and go through a quick hover of these seven steps so that you understand how pragmatic this is. It was designed for anyone to do on their own terms, in their own space, be as private with it as you want, as public with it as you want, or not do it. It's completely up to you. But the seven steps start with a brand you audit, which goes to your image, which leads to the identity, then your positioning, and then simply goals, strategies, and your implementation plan. It's a very sequentialized process that may take weeks to complete. Who knows this brand, Harley Davidson? Great brand, right? Step one is the brand you audit. The brand you audit is a step that we'll go through in just a second uh, about what that means. But the reason that Harley is a wonderful example for this story is that back in the 1960s, before you were even born, there was a Japanese invasion of motorcycles, Hondas, Kawasaki, Suzuki's, Yamahas. And the strategic plan took Harley away from their American roots. And had they checked with their group called HOG, what does HOG stand for? Harley Owners Group. That's exactly what it stands for. The Harley's Owners Group would have said, you're trying to do when you need to do with my motorcycle. Do not de-Americanize my Harley. And they went back, the company was sold, a venture capital firm bought this firm, repositioned it, went back to the core, and got it back on track. Today, because it's well positioned, 12% of new buyers are women. Women who are tired of sitting on the back of a Harley. <laughs> they want their own Harley, and they want to be able to ride it. But that is a great story of, the, um, of understanding the audit. Now, the five life phases are interesting. They come very fast until age 30. The first stage is basically childhood. You know, your, your memories, age 0 to 12. What do you remember from your early childhood? Which leads into your high school years. Multiple changes. All kinds of things happening. Everything's about fitting in, not fitting in. Being a part of this group, being a part of that group. And then you hit 18 to 22, where a lot of you are today, right? How many are in this group? Independence, experimentation, trying new things, stretching out, getting to know who you are, making mistakes, learning from them, moving on, falling in love, falling out of love. It's just filled with a lot in a few years. Then you hit 23, proving ground. How many of you are about ready to hit that stage? proving ground. You're getting ready to get out of college. You're getting ready to find your first of many jobs or your third of many jobs or your eighth of many jobs, whatever. But by the time you get out of this institution, people expect you to be a little bit on the straight and narrow and have a plan. So you'll be proving yourself. 
And then around age 30, 31 or so, you move into a phase that really goes the rest of your life. It's about adaptation, whatever life throws you, health, relationships, bankruptcy, who knows what. Then it's about adaptation. How well do you adapt to that? There was a woman that I uh, met after a speech, and she came up to me, and she said, how are we on time? Are we okay on time still? Um, she, she said, Jerry, I, I, I really appreciate your speech. Uh, I know what my issue is now. I said, well, that's powerful. What is it? I didn't make cheerleader in high school. <laughs> She's 51 years old. 51. She said, well, I'm 51 years old. I didn't make cheerleader in high school. I said, well, tell me about that. She said, well, you know what? I, I knew the cheers better than anyone else. I had the best tryout ever. I nailed it. I was in camp all week. I was there. I stayed late. I cleaned up. And a more popular girl won. A more popular girl was chosen. And so from age 16 until 51, she's had an issue with popular people. What an anchor, right, to carry around. But can you relate? Change the sentence. You've all had one. I had one. We've all had those. Rejection is a very painful situation. And so the more you can understand that brand audit and where you've been, so you can take the life learnings, take the lessons, deal with it, and move on, the more free you're going to be. The liberating is incredible. Now, there's a brand that you may not know a lot about. Maya Angelou, one of my heroes, who is a wonderful person who had every reason in life to not make it, proved them wrong, took the life of learning, grew from it, poet, doctor, most, one of the most respected women in the world today. And if you don't know her life story, it is a painful one to read. But your life story can be equally painful in its own way. And so take that as an inspiration to say, I can move through this. But phase one is merely the brand audit to understand where you are. It's a chronicle. It may take you weeks to go through. And you just go through and you chronicle what you remember from your life. There's a, in the book, there's a worksheet to follow. Um, image. The step, second step is brand image. When you see this brand, what comes to mind? Volvo. Safety. Very well positioned brand. If this car loses in the zero to 60 in consumer reports, is the brand tarnished? No. If it loses in styling, is the brand tarnished? No. If it loses in a crash test, big issues. You have an image today. The image of yourself today is the total perception others have of you. Believe it or not, you may think you're one cool, hip cat. And you may be to yourself. But it's important to understand what others see in you, what others think about you. Because I've seen a lot of people that have come into my office to interview for jobs with typos on their resume, misspelling Coca-Cola, Think about that for a minute. Coke, cola, Coke, C-O-K-E, cola, wrong spelling, you know? Oh, I want to work here, Mr. Wilson. No, you don't. <laughs> if you had, you would have spelled it right, right? Am I? Okay, all right. We'll go to a, 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 an image that is super strong, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who was uh, a lawyer Indian lawyer, went to South Africa, um, learned about oppression up front, went back to India, traded in his suits for the uh, Indian wear, and became the image for peaceful revolution. And to this day, Martin Luther King would say that he patterned a lot of his principles and practices and preachings around Mahatma Gandhi. And that image uh, of what he stood for, everyone knew that image, didn't they? How well is, is your image? How, how much do you know about your image? Because right now, if you think you're A and others see you as Z, there's a disconnect. Now, um, another worksheet here on image. And um, it's important to, to have input from others on how you're perceived. 
And at your young age, don't overstress it. Just try to figure out where you want to be and understand the image that you want to stand for. The first two steps are rear view mirrors. The next five, you're looking through the front of the car. Your identity is what you want to stand for, the position you want to occupy, and what kind of wonderful equities you have right now that you can transfer to different parts of life. What do you see on the screen on the left? LL Bean. It's not a trick question. <laughs> LL Bean. What do you see on the right? Subaru. Subaru. What does a boot company have in, you know, common with a car company? What's the, who said that? Outdoors you got lifestyle. outdoors lifestyle. Subaru all wheel drive is as comfortable in the Poconos as it is in Manhattan. <laughs> LL Bean, a boot company. That was founded as a boot company, outdoors. So no surprise, they took their equities and they created the L.L. Bean limited edition Subaru Outback. Higher priced, better leather, same four-wheel drive, same attributes. What attributes do you have that you could transfer? And don't think of it as merely I'm good at numbers. I'm good at speaking. What if you're the one in the crowd that's always able to find consensus when everyone is arguing? What if you're the one that has the ability to find a simple solution to a complicated problem? That can transfer well beyond the jobs you're applying for. This is a John Madden. Who knows John Madden? Identity. This is the regular guy. How does he get from football to football game, which he doesn't do anymore, but when he was doing it, how did he get from point A to point B? Bus. Why was he never at a Pro Bowl event? The bus doesn't go to Hawaii. What a, what a very simple guy who was a front lineman, football coach, you know, big guy, X's and O's, sweat, the whole bit. Identity. Front lineman, what is your identity? What do you want to stand for? What do you send out? The identity essence map, also in the book, helps you find that quadrant where your passion meets your skills. And when you can find a place where passion and skills come together, absolute satisfaction. The thing to watch out for as you go into work is that you get a job doing something that you hate, but you're really good at it. Right? It's the cubicle trap. So you're in there, you're a finance person, you're doing spreadsheets, they always balance, you're really good. The manager goes, wow, what's your name? Tim. Tim. So they said, that Tim cat, he's really good. He's like, they always balance. Tim's like, I hate this life. <laughs> when will they ever know me? It's like a Dilbert, you know? And it's like, they, it's like, well, he's really good. He must like what he's doing. Next, uh, next project. Now, don't, Tim, mess up to get out of there. But it's important that if you find yourself in a space that you're good with no passion, that's erosion. Long, slow erosion. Passion, love, skill set, even if it's entry level. You're not going to start as president. I hate to tell you that unless your mom or dad is a Maybe some of you will start as president. <laughs> if so, I need to talk to you. Next step, positioning. Who, you know, if you say, oh, that's all you have to say. Oh. Billion dollar brand. Oh. And every reason not to be successful. Abused as a child. You know, all of the stories that you hear. All of the life that she went through. Man, she is on top of the world. Didn't get Chicago with the Olympics, but that's okay. The, um, but she is everywhere. Positioning is all about the space you want to occupy. This is where you get serious about your target audience, frame of reference, competitive advantage, etc. And what you'll find is that everybody has a job description. Here's a guy that's basically a satellite installation guy putting in a roof, right? Not at all. This guy's bringing entertainment to this house. 
He is bringing the outside world in. He's bringing Africa Safari through National Geographic into that house. If he does his job right. If he does it wrong, it never happens. But you all have a job description. The key is to position yourself as bigger than whatever your job description is today. So how many of you are students today? Okay, Tim, get that hand up there, buddy. Tim. <laughs> so you're a student. Your job description is what? Go to class, study, make good grades. But what if your position to your school, your, your teacher, your faculty member, is when they look at your image, they're like, this lady would, doesn't want to be here. She's sending me all the negative vibes. I'm, I ask, never, you know, it's just, it, you don't get any love in the faculty seat. But what if you're the student that basically is inquisitive, you want to learn more, and you're positioning yourself to be one that's always curious? Because the best thing you can get here is how to learn, not memorization, how to learn as an adult growing. At the Coca-Cola company, there's a job called the chain operations manager. And that person calls on restaurant companies, and they're paid to know about fountain equipment, how it works, service, installation, engineering, you name it. Person A, same job, positioned as this. To my manager, I am meeting the requirements for this job because our department hit our goals and my performance review said so. Person A. Person B. To my customers, I'm the chief operations officer who brings unique solutions to their business before they even know they need them, which has helped their business succeed, resulting in the Coca-Cola company being named supplier of the year three years in a row. Who's going to get promoted? The, guy, the person that's worried about the manager? Target audience of one. Proof point, performance review. Frame of reference, inside, not outside. Think about yourself. Every job description is an, op is an invitation for you to position yourself bigger than the job. And every class you go to is an invitation for you to position yourself bigger than just trying to get a C and get out of here. I did that, so I can relate with that statement. <laughs> but you see what I mean. Play beyond the job description. Okay, um, we're in the home stretch. At this point, you've looked in the rearview mirror. You know your image. You've got an identity that you want to stand for, and you've got a positioning statement. You've written your own positioning statements. Now it's about setting goals that are smart, goals that you can achieve. And the reason I showed GE Years ago, the chairman of GE had two goals, very well known. We will be number one or number two in every industry we compete, period, or we will sell the companies. Second goal, we will then be the best leaders at running those businesses, which led to the entire development of management at GE. Two goals. What are your goals? Where do you want to be in 10 years? Generally speaking, what life do you want to lead in 10 years? And then in the next three, what are you taking? What actions are you taking that will get you toward that, toward that picture? Work, worksheets, worksheets, worksheets. Step six, strategies. Now this is the how-to. How will you achieve the goals that will allow you to create the positioning to establish the identity that leverages a fresh image that takes your gifts from your audit forward. The reason I like Gillette, their strategy was simple. We're going to give away these things because we're going to make a lot of money on that. I can't quite reach it. <laughs> but you get it. Give away the razor blades, or give away the razors and make a lot of money on the blades. Very simple strategy. Proprietary led to all kinds of innovation. There's a wonderful architect named Frank Lloyd Wright, and parts of your campus remind me of him. Parts of your campus remind me of Frank Lloyd Wright. Bringing together form and function. Creating a natural space that is symbiotic, 
with the buildings. This is one of his classic architectural homes to live in. The question here is how will you differentiate your approach to your life? More worksheets. Um, step seven is what are you going to do? Implementation, monitoring, always adjusting, putting it on a calendar, taking those baby steps. At the end of the, oh, FedEx, you know that why I like that one. Because when you say absolutely positively overnight, you're serious about implementation. That's a pretty serious statement. Um, brand you, every detail matters. What is your plan for success? I know you're young, and I know you think this is some old cat at Coke telling you what your parents would tell you. And maybe that's true. But you have such a rich future. These emerging trends that I started with, you're going to live those. You're going to see those. And with a billion more people in urban markets with middle class, that's going to change everything about America. It's going to change everything about the next 10 to 15 years more than you can imagine. So let's bring this thing home. You do your brand audit, and you realize that you're a bustling 21-year-old student. How many here are 21? OK. And you're in class, you're partway through your bachelor's degree. You're stressed a little bit, right? Take exams, trying to make the money match. You're trying to stay in touch with home. You're doing a lot of things. And you remember in your brand audit that early as a child, you used to take simple walks with your grandmother. Simple walks. And you remember that. And you're audit. You said, that was a great, good time, you know? I don't know what it means now, but it was a good time. And you begin to think about the image that you're projecting today, and you think, maybe I'm being perceived by others as a little bit stressed out, a little bit high maintenance, a little bit behind on what I'm trying to get done with all these classes here. And so you want to have an identity that you're more in control of yourself, that you're, that you're balancing out your life more, and you're succeeding in your studies. And so you position yourself toward that, and you begin to take actions where you say, I'm going to go back out into nature, even if it's just 30 minutes a day. Get some fresh air. I'm going to rebalance. I'm going to take that time for myself. I'm going to start meeting some fresh people that have different ideas. And suddenly you begin to take these little baby steps because I can assure you that brand audit is going to reach up and slap you. And you're going to say, I want to try something fresh, but you're going to have that little ghost that comes up. He says, remember that cheerleading incident. Remember, you didn't make it, but take baby steps. So the, the key to this step, take small steps that you want to develop into, and don't be afraid to do something that your friends make fun of you for doing. If it's true to you, if it means something to you, you owe it to yourself to go do that. So I know I'm pushing the time limit. I want to say thank you. If you have any... Um, Further questions or thoughts or what have you, I've got a website. Check it out. You can learn a little bit more about it. You can go and buy the book on Amazon.com, or you can just start thinking about yourself as a brand. And with that, Mike, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And we may have time for a couple of questions, um, or you may just want to leave, you know, <laughs> which is fine too. Yes, sir.
The, the question is, why isn't Coke advertising as much as Pepsi in, the long, in your travels around the world, right? Okay. The, um, actually, on a global basis, we advertise a lot more on Coke than Pepsi because Pepsi is a, diver is a diversified company with Frito-Lay and other divisions. And so when it comes to beverage to beverage, we are much more uh, of an advertiser than they are. Um, one of the things we've tried to do is to diversify our message. So how many here drink vitamin water? Okay, that's a Coke brand. <laughs> vitamin water. Um, Dasani water. Coke brand. Fanta, around the world, Coke brand. Coke Zero, a billion dollar Coke brand. So the idea is that as we continue to look for new ways to connect with consumers, you know, one of the things we're also seeing is that the old 30 second commercial is not as relevant as it was years gone by because of the digital age. And so we're putting more uh, energy on, uh, on other places while still trying to be relevant on those, uh, those key places for 30-second television. So uh, good question. Uh, we, we believe that we have many points to advertise from the shelf in a Publix all the way to a menu board at McDonald's to a 30-second spot on the Super Bowl. So the idea is how do you connect with more people and more occasions. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, live positively. That's right. We, we have in 78% of our total volume worldwide is now participating in our campaign called Open Happiness. And it's all about live positively and it brings into life the sustainability responsibilities that we all have as well as all kinds of attributes. But the uh, Open Happiness campaign is doing very well and it's especially bringing a bit of optimism to a world in this recession. So um, that is a, is a strong a message we have out there now. Yes, sir. Um, my question is in reference to more of an educational question. I'm thinking of getting my MBA eventually, and what I've been hearing from different friends I have in recruitment is it, not everybody has an MBA nowadays. It's all about where you get it from. So in your experience as having an MBA from Mercer, what, did you ever run into any challenges or anything where you were up against the Harvard guy and, or anything like that? Did you hear the question? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a true story. Um, I was... Uh, brand manager, um, strategic marketing director for the U.S. for Coke. And I was reviewing the people in the group. One had an MBA from Harvard. One had one from Wharton. <coughs> and one had one from Stanford. And they were reporting to me. <laughs> and so one of these guys came up to me, right? Said, hey, Jerry, you got an MBA, right? Where'd you go to school? I said, MIT. <laughs> They said, wow, what a great school. I'll see you yeah, at Mercer in town. <laughs> so he, uh, uh, I, I tell you, at the end of the day, um, not every, everybody doesn't have an MBA first. Um, a lot of people get an MBA for the wrong reason, which is to hang a sheepskin instead of learn and grow and develop. Uh, the, my MBA was my best learning because I was an adult. And it was relevant. And so I would take courses at night from 6 until 10. I'll never forget it. Just, you know, after working all day at Volkswagen, get in the car, drive to class. You're like, oh, man, I don't want to do this. So, and then weekends and what have you. But I took courses that correlated with my jobs. So when I was um, business management manager for the southeastern U.S., I was taking cost accounting. And I was taking different courses. I could go right back to work and put that into action. And I did that all along the way. And I loved it. It was just spectacular. You know, it's, it's kind of weird. It's like the, all this education is wasted on young people who just want to go and see the world. And then adults lose out. You almost need to reverse it somehow. But there is, um, I think that if you are considering a graduate degree, it should be in an area you really care about. And it's, it, that's your passion point. And for me, I wanted to accelerate my own learning. And the way to do it was to keep working well at Volkswagen while getting the outside turbo boost 
and putting that up against the work that I was doing. So I, um, I would say uh, there was Chris Matthews, who has a great show, Firing Line, was interviewed about college graduates. And he was talking about law school graduates. And one of the first things he said was, if you didn't get into the law school you wanted to go to, go to the best law school you can get into. And I really subscribe to that. Because at the end of the day, listen, it's about your output. And it's about what you can actually do in the world. Not, you know, that sheepskin is not going to last long. It's what you do with it that matters. It's a great question. aspiring to be something that you're quite, you know, haven't quite met. You uh, can fake it until you make it. Mm. Is that something that you've experienced? Uh, you can fake it until you're caught. It's probably more <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I've seen. Uh, this, this uh, I mean, one thing about this recession, it's weeding out a lot of, you know, marginal players. And it's weeding out a lot of great people, too. So it's, it's, it's all over the map. But this idea of fake it till you make it, um, I think that's probably out of style. I think now what you want to do is surround yourself with people that know what you need to know and try to grow with them. And so whether it's mentorships or whether it's relationships as you keep growing through, whether it's study groups you're in here, uh, you can bond with people that can help you be better. Um, but right now, uh, it's pretty, it's hard to hide. I mean, the business is too hard. And so, uh, you know, if your results aren't there, uh, the reports show that. Managers know it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really hard to, for that to happen. There was a, uh, there were several decades where you had, the demographics were so powerful. You know, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, you could just see population growing, per capita income growing, everything grow, going in your way. And so you could kind of get onto that, um, that train. Now, what's exciting about this new wave versus that wave is that this is going to be a much more inclusive wave because this is all about different people with different ideas coming at the same problems from a different perspective you know you look at what is it Zappos the shoe company how many people here love them owned by Amazon now this is just somebody that figured out how to sell shoes off the internet and had extraordinary service I went online one night at 8 o'clock and ordered a pair of shoes. They were at my house the next morning. You know, unbelievable. So um, that's what I would say. So thanks to one and all. I know you're tired. You have classes. Be true to yourself. Build brand new. And best of success. Thank you.